Hi and welcome to the Journalism Salute. I'm Mark Simon. In each episode, we'll talk to or about an interesting person or organization related to journalism. The intent is to show that journalists are not the enemy of the people. Thank you for listening. On today's episode, we are joined by Inez Russell Gomez. Inez is the editorial page editor of the Santa Fe New Mexican. Notable that we haven't talked to an editorial page editor yet, or a New Mexican yet. Her journalism career spans more than 40 years, and much of that has been in New Mexico. This episode was a suggestion of a friend of the podcast, Tracy Greer, and we're happy to have Inez. Inez, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So we start, as we start with every guest that we bring on, we want to know where it started for you. What's your journalism origin story? When you asked that question, it really brought back a lot of wonderful memories because I honestly don't remember a time when I wasn't going to be a reporter. It was something that, for whatever reason, I was fixated on since a very young child. So I grew up in Las Vegas, New Mexico, which is a small town. You might have seen it on the news this summer because the big fires in northern New Mexico were right around there. And my mother swears that when I was three or four, I used to take a notebook and a pencil, even though I did not know how to write, and go interview my neighbors and then come back to the kitchen and tell everyone what was going on in our neighborhood. So that's just what I was going to do. When I was right before middle school, my parents divorced and we moved to West Texas, where my stepfather was from. And I worked on my high school paper, was editor of the paper at Lubbock High School. I went to college two blocks from my house at Texas Tech University. I was editor of the paper there. And then I went to work like two weeks after graduation. And I have been in journalism ever since. And I always tell everybody I have worked at Dairy Queen and I have been a reporter. <laughs> and that's, that's my life. Was there anything in your upbringing or family history that would have lent itself to telling stories? I believe that every large Hispanic Norteño family in northern New Mexico is going to produce writers and storytellers because we had, so I'm on 7th Street and my, we lived with my grandma and she made tortillas for a living. So the, the house was always full of people coming and going, buying tortillas, you know, selling tortillas, doing everything that people would have conversations. So you grow up just listening to conversations. My mother got really involved in politics when she moved when, as an adult. So then we, there were all the political meetings. So just the combination of people telling the story of what happened downtown to the excitement of the political bosses meeting to discuss who was gonna run for governor or how the city was gonna be united, those kinds of things. I, I just think, it naturally led to wanting to tell stories. Prior to in being in the role that you're currently in, what are your some of your career highlights? Oh gosh, that when I was a very young reporter, so I my first job was in San Angelo, Texas. We were covering a Baptist retirement home and they were not safe. They had didn't have the right kind of fire sprinklers. And I had to cover the meetings and I got ejected and then I stood on the street and they threatened to arrest me. And that was very exciting. And it was also one of those existential questions that you get. It was true that the home was not safe, but on the other hand, there wasn't a fire. And if they couldn't afford to fix the sprinklers, everyone there lost their home. And as it was, everyone there lost their home. And I never could decide if we'd save their lives from you know, burning in a fire, or if we basically made them homeless by writing those stories. So that was an early one that I really enjoyed. When I was in Santa Fe in the 80s, George O'Keefe, the famous painter, passed away. And we were a very small staff in those days. And one of the arts reporters was supposed to have had all this background prepared on her death. And for whatever reason, probably because he was doing three stories a day on other things, he didn't have that ready. And he and the city editor got in a screaming fight over it. So I just kept working and I ended up being able to do the news obituary for her. And in the process of doing the obituary, someone gave me a tip that her will was going to be filed immediately. So I got a scoop on that. And that was, I beat the journal, I beat the big papers because everyone came to cover that. And that was just a lot of fun. And, and, and a huge and event. It, 
Yeah, it was. And, and I always said, you know, the, the paper was not a large paper, but when you're looking for another job, if your obituary is of Georgia O'Keeffe versus, you know, Minnie, the lady who lived down the street, people are going to pay more attention, even if you work at a small paper. It certainly stands out. Now, we should talk about your current position, your current paper. Your paper is independently owned, first published in 1849 in the capital city. It's about 90,000 people. You've been with them a long time. Uh, what are you most proud of with regards to the paper? Oh, gosh. Well, I am the most proud of the fact that we and our readers have a wonderful love affair. And that means they get mad at us sometimes. They are happy with us sometimes. But during the pandemic, I would venture to say that we might be one of the few papers in the country where readers passed the hat and bought full page ads and other ads in our paper to say thank you for being here we we treasure local journalism and wow that was that meant so much because as soon as everything shut down obviously we lost all our advertising we immediately kind of tightened the the belt and there was a small layoffs of a few people they cut everyone's hours or salary depending on which you were and we hunkered down because we didn't know how long it would be and people started calling and saying how can we help what can we do and they started you know basically purchasing ads and i've never i'll never forget that that's amazing especially given that as you said that's happened in so few places around the country why does that connection exist I think it exists because we have a long connection with our local community, the people who were born and raised here, whose you know grandparents were born and raised here. Because when you think about it, the, the, the details of their lives have been in our paper. You know, 200 years ago, you can go, or not 200, but 140 years ago, you might go look up what your grandpa did. And now his great grandchild is in the paper. And then we have a lot of people who retire here who just like to read. I mean, Santa Fe has an enormous number of used bookstores and new bookstores and independent bookstores. People here read and they appreciate what local journalism is and what it means to their knowledge about the world. And especially in recent years, people are moving here from places where the papers have been gutted by layoffs and by you know corporations whether it's a hedge fund or or just a newspaper chain so when they get here and they get you know kind of a robust local paper they're pretty happy you're making me want to move there with what you're saying what makes new mexico distinct and special to come it is a place where people have lived together for a long long time you know our city was founded before jamestown santa fe in terms of european founding before that of course we have 19 Pueblos that have lived here since time immemorial. There are several Apache tribes, the Navajo Nation, 23 Indian nations live in New Mexico. So we have a strong indigenous element. Then the Hispanics came in 1598. And it is not unknown for people to introduce themselves by I am a X generation New Mexican. You know, my mother was a 16th generation New Mexican. And that's a great thing. But then I always have to say, yeah, but my dad wasn't from here. And those things matter here. And then you have the mingling of the Americans who came after the Mexican-American War and the experience of being a territory and then a state. And it all kind of blends together in this interesting mix of cultures that don't quite get along but aren't at each other's throats either. How does the large Hispanic population play a role? It's really... Um, important because I think in so many places, and I found this when I moved to Texas and when I worked in Florida and I was, you know, a journalist around the country, there's always this urge to say, what do, you know, what do the Hispanics think? And they always put like question marks around it. Well, in New Mexico, you have everything from people like my mother's family that have been here for 400 years who, you know, aren't necessarily poor, starving, alcoholic, on drugs. You know, they all went to school and, and had successful careers to, you know, new immigrants who are entrepreneurs and doing lots of interesting things. And then we have, you know, very real issues in, in poor counties with, you know, drug abuse and other kinds of things. But you also have, you know, the governor of the state is a Hispanic. When I was a little girl in Las Vegas, I did not know that Anglo people ran things. 
And it wasn't until we moved to Texas that I found out that not everywhere was the mayor uh, an important Hispanic person or that not everyone was not Hispanic Catholic. So we are, I grew up anyway, knowing that we were the majority and that we could be in charge of things in a way that I did not see other places. So when you're covering that as a story, it's really important that you have reporters from the community. You can't have everybody move here from somewhere else. You have to have a knowledge of the place that is deeper. I was the stranger at my paper in Florida, but it was a much more mobile town. And I could figure things out fairly quickly. I think it's a lot harder to figure out a place like Santa Fe. So you really need to have reporters from the communities and from this place, or you're going to miss a ton of stories. So you're the editorial page editor, and we can talk about your role and what you do in that position. And my first thing related to that is simply taking everything that you just said. How does that all kind of form into a work day in the life? And what does that look like for you? Well, the big thing about what we do is that, so we have an editorial page seven days a week. One day a week, we run something from the Washington Post or Bloomberg, kind of a national perspective or international perspective. But I write editorial six days a week. I edit all the letters. I edit all the my views. We have a very robust reader community and they write letters, they have opinions and they send them. So there's a lot of just like, sitting down and physically editing every day. There's a lot of reading other publications, newspapers, you know, blogs, whatever, to come up with the ideas that you want to put in. And there's also time to out, you know, reach out to communities that, that you might miss because, you know, the Hispanic community obviously plays a huge role in our coverage and what we write about, but then so does the indigenous community. And they are people that have been left out of news coverage for years for different reasons. And it's really important that you get that perspective and you speak to lots of different voices. So there's part of what you do is you're waiting for stuff to come in. And part of what you do is you're going out to seek it because you want to make sure that your paper, because Robin Martin, who's the owner of our paper, who's the reason we're independent, she inherited it from her dad and has kept it, you know, robust and thriving. She wants the editorial page to be a place where people can have a conversation that is civil and produces solutions. So <laughs> we, ha we have to make that happen. And, and all right. So taking like something from this week, can you, can you give us an example of like your decision process with regards to trying to come up with what to write and what to put on the page? Sure. This week is a little strange because we're getting ready to go into a holiday. So one of the things I'm doing this week is trying to do next week too, so that if I take a few days off, I'm actually off. But, but a longer term thing that we're talking about is Santa Fe is growing like so many Southwestern towns. And we have a road in town called Richards Avenue, which stops at rodeo and then several blocks on the other side, picks up again and goes to the other side of town. The two Richards have never been connected. And for years, we were skeptical of whether connecting the roads would do much except for ruining the neighborhoods around the road. And it's going to come up again as a conversation because even when they were talking about connecting the roads before, the state owned part of the land and didn't want anything to go through their land. But the city has now purchased that land. So if the city wants to build a connecting, section of Richards Avenue, it can. So we're chatting back and forth about, well, what do we want to do? You know, is it worth eliminating some traffic to maybe damage a neighborhood or should we do something else? And that's kind of the conversation that it's not going to, we're not going to write about it for a while, but we're starting to talk about these things. So that that's one of the things that I've been working on. Small city journalism. <laughs> so in my in my time as a writer, I have written one editorial in the voice of the paper, and that was for my college paper when they decided that artificial turf was the way to go, and I, it was causing some injuries, and I didn't particularly care for that. And I wrote it, in the, I tried to write in the voice of the newspaper, and I loved it, and it was a really good challenge. It was intellectually stimulating. If I say all that to ask you, 
your writing as the voice of the newspaper and the Santa Fe, New, the Santa Fe, New Mexican. What's that like? It's sort of, I think, a big responsibility because it's not supposed to be, you know, my personal opinion. It's not supposed to be the way it was when I had, I had a column for a long time and that was my opinion and that was my life. And that was, you know, the stories that I wanted to share. The newspaper is an institution. So you have to make sure that what is being told is what the owner wants because, you know, it's her paper. She owns the presses and you have to, I think, be a little more formal, hopefully not pompous, but, but kind of, leave something that makes the point as as the voice of the paper and also let's say like with richards avenue if we decide that yes now it's the time to build the connection we have to go back to previous editorials to say here's why we've changed our position or nuanced it so it's really important when you're the voice of the paper not to abruptly shift gears so you have to have a lot of knowledge about what was done in the past to keep that going so that you, there's a, a logical continuation of whatever your opinions are on different issues. And that goes back to what you talked about with having people that are from the community that are working for, that are long time from the community that are working for your paper. Some examples of things that you've written recently, we must not let our veterans down on Veterans Day. Powerball winning isn't all it's cracked up to be. Uh, you lauded a political commercial commercial for the Commissioner of Public Lands because it featured both candidates essentially saying that they would accept the results and that, as you said before, civility. And then the Teacher of the Year, uh, State Teacher of the Year celebration. How else do you come up with your editorial ideas? I ask the community. I always tell people when I see them, if you have an idea, send me an idea. The owner of the paper, Robin, has ideas and she gives them to me. Phil Casaus is our editor and he has ideas and he shares them. And I'm always grateful for those because the more ideas you get, the less you have to think of them. A lot of times you just, just read the paper and you find them in briefs and want ads. I mean, just, there's all sorts of places. I'm working on one that's not particularly you know, weighty or important because Lonely Planet named Santa Fe one of 30 places in the world to visit in 2023. We're more worthy than, you know, most of the globe. And that's just a fun, quick one that you can do during holiday week to try to get going. So you try to have something that takes research and interviews and has facts and all those kinds of important things. Then maybe you have one that's advancing a position you've talked about before. Let's say we do one on the new EPA methane gas rules. We have a position on that and we can kind of top that with the latest decision. Then maybe you kind of do a funny one, you see, and then you do one off the news, like the, the, the one of the land commissioners, I wanted to have a closing election editorial that wasn't repeating things we'd said before. And because they had done that ad, that gave me a new way into saying, don't forget to go vote basically. So you have like lots of different kind of ways to get in the paper and you keep that up by reading widely. And, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts now when I walk and that gives me more places to get ideas. So Santa Fe voted for Joe Biden at 76%, the second highest of any county in the state. What is it like to do candidate endorsements? It's actually busier in the primary because then you have a bunch of people running in the Democratic primary here locally and not as many Republican candidates. So you end up having to do a ton of interviews. So it's exhausting is what it is. But it's very interesting because you listen to people who have done their research or you listen to people who have not done their research and you learn a lot about you know public servants so our owner thinks it's something that papers can do to share what they see with the public with the understanding that of course it's up to people to decide you know how they want to vote and why they want to vote and and one could argue that people might hear the endorsement and say oh my gosh we hate the new mexican we're going to do the exact opposite <laughs> you know so it's just, it's a, it's a really important process for our owner and we take it very seriously and we work really hard on them. Back on the very first episode of this podcast, I interviewed Eve Perlman of Spaceship Media. Spaceship now has its own podcast out. I've listened to every episode so far and it's quite good. Here's a promo. 
she thinks her ability to Google is going to figure out some big global conspiracy. That so has- many issues have wedged families apart the last few years. Personal, political, a global pandemic. I haven't wanted to ask if you were going to get vaccinated because I couldn't live with the terror that brings in me. How one mother and daughter unwedged the issues that divided them. Colorado Public Radio presents The Wedge, everywhere you get your podcasts. Now back to my interview. I read one of your first pieces when you became editor in 2011 and how you told of how you lost a columnist who refused to be edited, and you <laughs> openly advertised for a conservative writer. How has the editorial page evolved under your leadership? It has evolved. We, we found Dorothy took over and she did a very good job. And then one day, they told me you have no more money to pay local columnists because we had, in those days, we had a conservative columnist, we had a local from the Nambe Valley, and we had Harlan Macasito who used to run Native America Calling. So kind of a wide perspective. And before I became editorial page editor, I was actually one of the columnists. And my spot was taken by Steve Terrell, who was our political writer. And we rotated them. Steve ran every week, I think, and then the other three swapped. And then I didn't have any more cash to pay them, so they all went away. And so we've evolved into being much more reader-driven. We have, I think, worked hard at anticipating issues. So sometimes instead of waiting for things to come in, you go and say, can you guys do pieces on X, you know, whatever, the obelisk falling or one of the the big stories we've had, like when Roe v. Wade was overturned, we took the Saturday paper and immediately basically sent out a call, what do you want to say? And I got, even without the call, we got probably enough to fill three pages and we ended up just filling one. So I hope, you know, we try to be proactive. I'm not as brilliant as, as Bill Waters was, and he was a trained lawyer. He had a wonderful mind. He, he was editorial page editor for 20 years. But I think having a female gives you a little bit different of a perspective. It's not better or worse. It's just different. You know, I don't know how many editorials he wrote about breastfeeding, and I've done a couple. <laughs> so it, it just gives a little different idea, I you, think. You described Bill as doing work with intelligence, passion, and skill. So what are your mm-hmm. trademarks as a writer? Oh, gosh. I love writing about New Mexico. I, I, I always tell people how many people get to work at the paper they delivered as a child. Because when I was a little girl, we delivered the Optic in Las Vegas, and the New Mexican had a deal. If you buy one, you got the other one cheaper. So we threw that every afternoon on our bikes. I love things to do with the history of this place, with our cultures, with our coming together. I'm very passionate about justice and equality. And so I write about those things a lot. Uh, I was an education reporter and edited education writers for years. So I write a lot about education. Um, I also did, I was home for a few years when my son was little and a public school student here. So I did a lot of volunteer work in our schools. So I come to some of those editorials as a journalist, but also as a past participant. So I think those are things that maybe, I don't know if they set me apart, but those are just things I bring to the work. And education is a big issue in the state right now, right? Yes, yes, it is. It is. The pandemic really kind of, we had a lot of reforms going on and we are going to have to do some catching up and we just... You know, there's, it's, it's something that goes back, you know, decades to why we don't do as well as we should. Although I always say, even though for whatever reason we don't perform well on tests, a lot of New Mexico kids and individuals, I mean, we're a small state, so some of this, you know, anecdotally, but you can see in your life, you know, I was a product of New Mexico public schools. Our Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez goes to Yale from West Las Vegas. Simon Romero, who's the New York Times correspondent based in Albuquerque, he went to Harvard from West Las Vegas. And there's just a ton of people like that. So I sometimes I wonder if we need to measure what we're doing differently to actually show whether we're successful or not successful. So the New Mexican 
just segueing to something else. The New Mexican mm -hmm. employee is the only Native American cartoonist in a mainstream paper. Can you yeah. tell us about him and the work he does? Yes, yes, I'd love to. He's he's my very good friend. Ricardo Cate is from Santo Domingo or Quehua Pueblo, which is a few 20 minutes outside of Santa Fe. And he is an ex-Marine. I think he went to Fort Lewis College in Colorado where he graduated and was a stand-up comic and he had always, always liked to draw. And so one day he comes in off the street to uh, go to Bernadette Garcia, who in those days was in charge of the cartoons and says, I should be in your paper. And she explains to him, we don't really take people off the streets for our syndicated comics, but you could send them to the editor, you could do this. And he's like, no, no, I want to be on this page. And he was very specific about what he wanted. So she says, well, why don't you do some more and we'll talk later. So off he goes. We didn't see him for a year. And he comes back and he has a bunch of cartoons. And right about that time, one of our single panel cartoons left. And we had a hole on the page. And Bernadette talked Rob Dean, who was our editor then, into giving Ricardo a chance. And it, I still say, is one of the best things we ever did because he's the most popular cartoonist in the paper. We did a survey a few years ago and he won by forever <laughs> his perspective you know it gives you this insight into the native world in a way that you wouldn't get otherwise plus it's just universal you know the things that are happening he has a character the chief and then he has the general who you know looks like george armstrong custer we imagine would look and they just go back and forth. And there are things that are very specific to Indians if you've been around them. And there are things that are just anyone can understand. His first cartoon was the chief looking with his son saying some, and they're out looking over a valley and it says, son, some, someday none of this will be yours. <laughs> That's, that seems very, I guess, and apt. He, he, it is. And he's got a website. I think if you Google Ricardo Cate, you can find it. He has books, he has t-shirts yep. and he's just brought so much to our newspaper. And, and I'm, I'm very happy that Bernadette was brave and said yes and talked Rob into it. Bringing different perspectives seems to be very important to what you do. And it's important to the role of an editorial page editor. So how do you define fairness? That's a great question because you know, when I first started in journalism, fairness was just the facts, let people decide. And there was always this kind of presumption that the facts were neutral. And when you think about today, let, you know, just take, let's say you take climate change. On one hand, you have, you know, 98% of the world's scientists, the fact that we're burning up and temperatures are hotter. And on the other, you have, the 2% of people who are saying, well, it's the sunspots. So is it fair to say on one hand or on the other hand? I don't know if that's fair. You know, was it fair to go years without saying Donald Trump was lying and just say he misspoke or there was a misstatement? So I think in today's world, we have to, you know, on the editorial page, obviously I get to have opinions of, and then I get to make sure my letter writers can't lie about things. They have to be factual so they can have an opinion on something. But if it's completely not true, then I don't know that that's fair to everybody else to run it. And, and for neutral reporters, I think it's really important to remember that you don't have to spotlight people who lie in the same way that you do people who don't lie. So I don't know if that answers what is fairness. Fairness is, is impartiality and objectivity and all of those things, but you're not being fair if you're giving equal weight to like election deniers when there's no proof of the election being stolen. You with, know? with all of the different things that you've had exposure to in the last 40 years, how has being a journalist shaped how you view the world? Boy, I think it really affects my relationships with my family because I cannot tell you how many times they have said to me, this is off the record. And I always <laughs> tell them, if you tell me something and it's really juicy, nothing is ever off the record, so don't tell me. And especially when I got back to New Mexico, I have, I have a million first cousins, some of whom were doing things that were newsworthy and that I learned about. 
And they would call me if they wanted to share it, but a lot of times they would tell me on accident and then say, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to. But to me, everything is a story. So that, that's how I view the world. And well, so I have two questions that relate to ideally mentoring some of the younger listeners that we might have. In your 40 years of experience, do you have an example of learning an important lesson from a mistake? Yeah, well, bunches. And I thought about this a lot and I, and I ended up going to, when I was a young editor in Florida, I would get the baby reporters. And one of my best reporters, who is now herself a top editor at a very large paper, she came back from a story and there had been a fire. And I said, okay, what can you tell me about it? And I go through it, you know, was it a big deal? Was it arson? Well, I don't know, I don't know, it's just a fire. It was a warehouse, it was an empty building. And so she writes a brief. And in those days, I was at the Bradenton Herald. We were competing against St. Pete, Tampa, and Sarasota. It was a huge newspaper war, and it was really, really tough. And if you missed something, you would get it circled in red on your desk and get yelled at for missing it. So I go to work the next day thinking I had done a good job, and that brief was a front page story in the other papers because it was arson. Someone had killed a dog to get into the place, and I think they might have even scared off the guard. It was like a big story and we totally blew it. And I did not ask her enough questions at the time. And like I told her, what about, you know, didn't you know the dog was dead? I remember asking her after and she's like, dogs die all the time. And I was like, his throat was slit. And I know that you have to, when you're coming back as a young reporter, deconstruct all the details because something you don't know will be a trigger for an editor who has more of a brain than I did that night. So, so just really pay attention to the details. That's, that's what I learned is, and after that, I was much better at deconstructing the reporter as they got back from the scene. This is the value of editors, certainly. And then the other question would be, Let's say that there was someone out there who said, I want to have your career. What would you, what advice would you give to them to try to develop it? Well, in today's world, I think I would say go do something else. Oh no, don't say that. I love journalism. And I, like I said, I never wanted to do anything else. I think what you can always say to anyone who's young is read widely, read good writers, uh, you know, read the paper. I was on the board or I went back to my college as a speaker a few years ago. And one of the internship coordinators said, these kids don't want to get internships. How can we make them? And I said, you know, stop right there. I, I looked at the room and I said, how many of you guys read a newspaper, an online blog, news? And they literally, like four of them raised their hand. It was ridiculous. And I told the internship coordinator, I said, those people should not go into journalism. If you're not curious about the world, go do something else. This is a hard job. It's a hard career. It's changing rapidly. And you have to love news and you have to love sharing news with people and doing stories that make a difference in, in the community. So if you want a career in journalism, know that it's going to probably not be in print the whole time, which is fine because you can tell stories online just as well and probably better know that you need to be able to write, you need to be able to communicate. If I were 10 years younger, I'd probably learn how to do video or do a podcast like you're doing. I'm, I may start one soon, so I probably will be learning that. Get as many skills as you can. Radio is a great skill to have. Let's say you want to go report in a, a country where the internet isn't solid. So just be open to knowing as much as you can doing as much as you can. And while you're in college, before you get off to, you know, be the impartial journalist, I would say be more a part of your community. I didn't really do that till I got older because I had a kid and I was helping in the schools and I started volunteering with some different nonprofits in town for food and for the homeless over the pandemic. And I get a lot more stories that way than I do sitting in my office. So you don't want to have too many conflicts of interest, but you need to be a part of whatever world you're going to be covering. 
so many good lessons from this interview. We go to the last question. We say that the show is called the Journalism Salute because we salute, we're here to salute you for your good work. And we ask that you do likewise. Is there someone that you'd like to salute for their good work? Maybe someone that we would not know. Well, I thought of that. And the, there's a group in New Mexico called the Foundation for Open Government, which exists to remind everybody that the First Amendment belongs to them. It's for journalists, of course, it's for newspapers and TV reporters, but it's also for individuals. And they are a resource. Let's say you want to get records from a, a body that will not share it. And you can call them and they will help you do an IPRA. They will help you seek what you, you know, should be given without being bothered. And they also, our newspaper combined with them recently to go after a police department in Rio Rancho that was not giving records when a, a deputy son had fatally shot himself. So I think fog was established in 1990, still going strong, and it helps you individually. And then it also helps the legislature pass laws that are dedicated to sunshine and transparency and better open government. And Thank so that's, that, that's great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I really, I salute them. They, they do a great job. I, I appreciate that. We don't typically get organizations like that. We typically get, you know, more specific journalism things, but I think that, that that's terrific. Inez Go uh, Russell Gomez, thank you for joining us. The website, uh, the, the paper is the Santa Fe New Mexican. The website is santafenewmexican.com. If you're not in the state, I encourage you to check it out. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And those were lovely questions. And I'm going to go back and listen to other people and get inspired. Thank you for listening to the Journalism Salute. Please let us know what you think of the show. You can find us on Twitter at JournalismPod, and you can email us at JournalismSalute at gmail.com.